Are we on? We're on. Everyone can hear me? Welcome back from break. Um, I'm very excited about this next panel. We've got two very exciting guests um, who I'd love to introduce. The first is Jason White. He's a multi multidisciplinary scientist and the founder of CEO of Silent Labs, a creative uh, studio and research lab dedicated to the exploration of microorganisms and biotechnologies in society, which he founded in 2022. Silent Lab's mission is to provide culturally significant products and experiences that honor nature and its design through collaboration with different industries. He's also the former director of fermentation at a small restaurant you might have heard of called Noma. Um, Jason is committed to uh, spreading knowledge and encouraging others to build a relationship with not only technologies and also ingredients in each other in the process. Please welcome Jason White. And next to him, we have Mara King, Director of Fermentation and General Manager of Dry Storage Mills for IDS, an impact-driven Colorado-based restaurant group in Grand Mill, where she fuses her passion for traditional arts to enliven and amplify the restaurant group's fermentation pro programs. In 2011, Mara co-founded Ozuke, a fermented foods company that distributes nationally in the U.S., and in 2017, she helped to produce a series of short films on southwestern Chinese fermentation practices called People's Republic of Fermentation with Sandra Katz and Matias Sakaboto, and is currently working on a book about these practices. Um, so welcome to Mara King as well. And I am so, I'm going to come join you on the, on the chairs, but I am so excited about both of your work. And I wonder, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I wonder if we should jump right in. And I think the easiest way to do that is, can I ask you both about a favorite recent project or a favorite project that you think best represents your approach to fermentation? Well, I mean, I've worked in so many different categories of fermentation, everything from food to biotechnologies and um, even some like uh, essential oil production that uses fermentation processes. So the, the span of like my projects can, all of them have been very sentimental to me and all of them have been very collaborative. Uh, so, but if I had to speak on one project specifically that really relates to this conference, it would be one that I did in Denmark, which was called The Story of the Tree. And this was a project where it really involved a lot of moments in nature where sensory kind of like callings from um, plants are acknowledged, whether it's blossoms from a tree or whether it is uh, the actual season in which like the, the smell in the air and the rain and the soil are really contributing to like uh, the, the, the atmosphere inside of uh, um, uh, the forest or in, in, the, in the woods, right? And so the story of the tree involved harvesting water from a birch tree over a year's time. Um, and during this process, uh, we would reduce the water and we would boil it with the wood that, uh, that was left over from the birch tree. Um, each season of the harvest, the water would produce different flavor profiles. Some of it would taste like cherry wood, some of it would taste like uh, bitter, some of it would taste a little floral and nutty, uh, and some of it would be very tannic and almost make your mouth salivate. Right? And so typically whenever this water is collected, you would collect water from maybe one season, maybe you would have some water left over from another season. But the whole point of this was to combine all the waters together so that we could tell a story of how each season contributes to the flavor profile of the water. And then being fearless in a way to where we could blend them all together to create one harmonious flavor. But the project didn't stop there because after a year's time of har harvesting and foraging this water, we were also collecting pollen and we were also collecting the buds from the tree before they blossom, right? And a cool thing about this is, is that the pollen is, has kind of like a, a nutty and earthy and woody kind of flavor and it also has a bunch of health benefits like nutrients and vitamins and minerals, right? Uh, and another thing is, is that the blossoms from the tree, which come out at different parts of the seasons, you know, like this is a whole map of a year with a tree. Uh, the blossoms, before they open, they're very sticky with essential oils and with like almost like a tar gummy kind of uh, substance. And this is, smells like patchouli or it smells like, you know, if a hippie walked into your restaurant. <laughs> um, and so the cool thing about it was is that we used some technologies, a very, you know, when I say technology, I don't mean some big machine that you can't really decipher. Uh, we used a uh, heat press, which can be used to like press shirts and remove wrinkles. And we squeezed all the essential oils out of the buds before it turned into flowers, right? And then we made ice cubes that were seasoned with the essential oils from the buds. So that way it tasted as it melted inside of the beverage, it would leak out the flavors of the pollen and the sap. 
And then we took all the blended water, reduced it to a syrup, and turned it into a kombucha. And the water was served with the ice cube that had the pollen and the bud encapsulated inside of it. So as you drank it, you would taste all the seasons of the tree. Wow. I was expecting, like, a pickle. So. <laughs> Sorry, that was 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was definitely a heartfelt project. Um, one of the favorite projects that I'm working on currently, so um, I work with a restaurant group that has five restaurants and also a grain mill. And um, one of the things I've sort of put upon myself um, in the business um, is to try and find ways to reduce waste and to utilize, um, you know, all of the tools in the fermentation um, crayon box to be able to figure that out. Um, and so, you know, from the... From the bakery, we have lots of like country loaves. You know, you can't always figure out exactly how many loaves to bake for the day. So country loaves are left over. And I've been, you know, the first approach I took to that was um, fermenting uh, kvass, uh, which is very simple. And we can put it in a keg and put a fizzy, delicious beer, beer slightly beer reminiscent soda on tap. And they bought these really charming little um, Steins, like itty bitty steins to serve it in. Um, so that's that was like very straightforward and easy. And then another um, thing that I did was I created a um, an amino paste. So the sourdough gochujang that I made from the country loaves is now sort of a standard across all of our restaurants. Um, they call it the the Gucci sauce. I don't know. <laughs> why it, kids these days i don't quite understand what that means but they you know the the gucci sauce finds its way into everything um and then um we opened a new restaurant in january and at that restaurant um, we utilize our delicious grains to um, make a, a japanese milk bread so that's a very different style of bread um, very high protein um, lots of butter lots of milk um, so I've been recycling that into um, Tian Mianjiang, which is in China, a <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the sauces that is was traditionally made out of what were bao buns or like um, steamed bread, um, and that's been super surprising and delicious because of the high protein content. There's a there's a bit of a um, blue cheese uh, aroma to it all, and it's um, it's delicious. And then um, the most recent project with the recycling bread, um, I've been working with a local maltster, and we had a maltster speaking just now, um, who, who also creates floor malt, and I take the malt, I cook, I basically make a wort with leftover bread from the malt, and then I cook that down into a syrup, and then that goes back into desserts and stuff, so we have literally like malted, milkshakes or malted ice, malted syrup on ice creams. Um, and actually it can be utilized to put back into the baking of new bread. So that's like a real full cycle moment. So what I'm hearing from both of you in both of these projects is that in both ways, fermentation is being used to either preserve or extend or transform sort of the essence of a thing. In your case, the birch, and in your case, either the leftover bread or the bread that can be used for other things. Um, and I think that there's something interesting about the fact that like fermentation is such an, a, a long time uh, and a, a phenomenon, right? It has, I, wouldn't call, I don't want to call it a trend because that's silly, but like fundamentally it's been around for so long for this reason of preservation. Um, but I'm curious about how both of you see this long time thing that has been around forever intersecting with the ways that you approach it. Um, I know that you have been working quite a bit, Jason, with sort of the scientific sort of advancements, and some of them are as much as a press, but can you talk a little bit about... Yeah, I mean, you know, like, uh, fermentation is one of those uh, situations in the human story that has left a fingerprint on us uh, that is never going anywhere. And we have also influenced microorganisms and fungi f since the beginning of our story as well. And it's been this mutualism that has existed underneath everything that we do, uh, everything that we eat, and uh, all of the kind of like social uh, things that we do together. Fermentation is always there as like the little whispering voice of flavor. Um, you can go as far back as ancient Mesopotamia and you can find fermentation recipes written in cuneiform tablets. Uh, you can go back to ancient China and you can see po uh, like poems that are written 
on fermentation recipes that involve astrology and like the positions of the, the lunar cycles and also how that relates to the seasons and also how that relates to humans harvesting and fermenting these products and then making the most of them and preserving them into the future, right? This was ancient 2,000, 3,000 years ago as far as we know it, and that's based off of just the recording of it all. What was going on before things were recorded, right? So this is us. We are in this entanglement with microorganisms, right? So when I think about now in culture today, why are the kids saying Gucci? It's because people are like, you know, everyone knows that kids are saying Gucci. So the reason why everyone knows that kids are saying Gucci and all these pop topics are like circling around is the same way that like innovations in food technologies can also spread amongst all of us. And that's the way that they are now. If you go on Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn and you look up how many people are posting the fermentation hashtag, you can see upwards in the 21 million, right? We're talking about 21 million people are using the fermentation hashtag just recently on the algorithm, right? And this is people like all of us here and also people who are um, contributing to the big biotechnology side of it. Science can be a very scary thing and some people might here might be like, oh, GMOs and all these different situations are actually going to hinder the growth of agriculture and hinder the growth of traditions. But the thing about it is, is that science can also contribute good to it. There are some genetically modified organisms that can benefit crops. For instance, there, when, when I first went to Denmark, I went to Carlsberg Brewery, which was uh, one of the first places to make safely cultivated yeast available to the public. It has a long history of, brew of brewing uh, safety and also culture throughout the world. Um, and when I was there, there was a scientist who I had met because a bunch of scientists were like, oh, you're that guy who's doing the new stuff with fermentation. We got to give you a private tour of the lab. So I went to the lab and she, she was like, I got this exciting thing to show you. It's so incredible. And I was like, oh, great. Let's see it. And she put it a little screen on the middle of a conference room. And it was just a slow moving video of like a little yeast cell moving as slow as you could possibly imagine it, crawling as slow as you could ever imagine to this thing and then eating it. And she was like, we made a yeast yeast that kills other bacteria that kills crops, right? And so what this was actually doing is like this yeast can actually prevent crops from just being infected and infested and ruined and also from an economical point of view can be beneficial, right? But that's just one example. There's also situations where technology can be used for us to better understand the components of nature itself, whether it's extracting aromas and flavors out of it, whether it's extracting colors and pigmentations out of fungi or bacteria or plants. All of these kinds of scientific approaches to nature can make us experience it in new and different ways. The reason why you, like, you, like when somebody walks by, by you with an amazing aroma and it, it affects you is because nature is powerful in that way. When you eat something that has complex acids like lime and lemons and all this stuff, it is exciting to your palate because it's complex acids. Uh, you know, whenever you walk through the forest and you, all these things like the blossoms from the birch tree are speaking to you, uh, those are messages from nature. And I think now society is ready to turn the volume up on nature. All we have to do is have the willingness and the openness to understand where the limits of technology, the importance of culture, and also the value of tradition stand in our identities today in food and also in other industries as well, like clothing and fashion. You know, you go to Gucci and all these other people are now starting to use plant pigments and it's just gonna get better and better and better. I used to have to fight to get fermentation to be a main topic inside of restaurants. Now, almost everybody who's applying at a restaurant is like, I can ferment, I can ferment, I can ferment. What are we gonna do with this? All, people here, I'm sure all of you are, are curious and I think I encourage you to make sure that you look at those hashtags, buy the book, buy the locally made fermented product at the store and support these people because this food like, like ethos that's happening with fermentation can also carry over to influencing the big science people as well when they see that culture needs it this way. That's amazing, that's an incredible answer. And uh, Mara, I was wondering if you could maybe help expand on that a little bit because the question is, if everyone is making it, um, one of the things that I was hoping that we could, we could hear from you is how would, say, somebody take that home fermentation or take that experimental fermentation, the stuff that's happening on, on, that they're putting on Instagram, and translate that to a c restaurant kitchen? How do you like, build a fermentation practice in a restaurant kitchen without making the health department mad, without getting in trouble? Like, how do you do it? Well, well I mean, the, the, the main approach up to now has been um, 
hide everything when the health inspector shows up. Like have a have a specialized closet where you where you put all of your strange things that you don't want to explain to them away as quickly as possible. Um, so um, panic and subterfuge has been the way up to now. Um, no, actually, I, utilizing my experience building a factory and fermenting in said factory, um, it's been a really kind of interesting part of my career to um, develop systems of, um, of like process and process engineering would be a good way to put it. And um, early on, when I was building my safety systems for my factory, you know, I worked with an, um, an engineer, and uh, he helped me figure out, like, you know, when you have a huge number of forms to fill out, like in terms of how to make sure you're doing the safety checks and marks every single day or every single week or every single month. Um, he helped me figure out the best way to keep track of things is to divide them into per periods of time. So I, I created a set of periodic checks that I would do. Um, and then of course, you know, like Jason showed me all of his beautiful HACCP plans that he wrote for Noma. Like every single process that you utilize needs to have a plan that's written around it that conforms to whatever it is, you, whomever you're dealing with. I mean, oftentimes when you're dealing with um, a town or a, um, especially like a local city health inspector, you are, you probably know way more about fermentation and the science of what's going on in that fermentation process than the health inspector does. So what becomes super important is that you need to make sure that you're doing things in a clear way that can be explained simply and that you're keeping your records in a, you know, in a plain and simple fashion. Um, I'm, uh, I've, 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 I'm utilizing a software now, it's called Smart Food Safe, and they're super awesome. They've helped me build the systems that we're using across all five restaurants, and then each fermentation process has its own paperwork that goes with it. Um, and it's awesome because, you know, these chefs are, go through and they have to fill out the paperwork and do the checks um, with each process that they do. So they like, okay, I'm doing koji, I've got to fill out the checks. I'm doing miso, I've got to fill out the checks. And it's, the, the paperwork is sort of like a training thing in a way as well. Like they can, um, by filling out the steps, they're like, okay, this is a safety step, this is a safety step, this is a safety step. Oh, I'm understanding a little bit more of the process of what I'm doing as well. That's, no, that's, and I'm curious then for both of you, if <clears throat> someone came to you and said, I'd like to add fermentation to my menu, where would you tell them to start? Me personally, I would say that um, if they want to add fermentation, fermented products to their menu, the first thing that they should probably work with would be pickles, which is one of those situations where it's most common. But it also can be very empowering because of the diversity of pickles. I, I like the underdogs in fermentation like pickles and kombucha because the base ingredient is literally like the full spectrum of anything. Like you could make a pickle from almost any vegetable or fruit, right? So when you um, work with that as a base, you really understand the fundamentals of fermentation, whether it's how much salt is appropriate, the balance, like for instance, if you ferment a piece of fruit and you put too much salt, even though it fermented safely, it might just be like a really salty fruit and it's not that palatable. So understanding the limitations of like how much salt is appropriate, not only for safety, but also for flavor, because you don't want to lose ingredients in the process. You don't want to obliterate a fermented, fermented ingredient so much that you don't resemble it anymore. So uh, seeing people kind of play with pickles and making them crunchy or making them sour or sweet can be very empowering for a sh uh, chef or cook or even at home, uh, because we all know most for the most part, what pickles taste like. So you have a frame of reference for it, and you have a way of, like, you know, some, of something to go off of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. It's like the starting point. There's a base. It's also, it's empowering, too, because one is you also get to have conversations with all your farmers and everybody about, like, the best ingredients to use. You involve your staff with them also. Like, like what she was saying about the HACCP plan and doing all the regulatory stuff, I also think it's important that you empower each chef and each cook inside of your restaurant to understand how to put a HACCP plan together themselves. 
right? Because then they're going to go to their places and they're going to start doing that. So the same thing happens with pickles. When we're passing off these traditions. Uh, I mean, we're passing off a tradition that's been around for forever. So it's always super good to see people um, take that and run with it and then transform it into another process like miso or more complex fermentation stuff. Uh, the, the flavors of pickles can be also be extremely powerful. I mean, you know, like you could have the acidity of the ingredient you're turning into a pickle, plus you can ferment it to where lactobacillus is produced, which is another kind of acid. And then you could even put uh, more vinegar on top of that and make it like just a, a powerful, like little whirlwind of flavor in your mouth. Like don't get under, don't, don't undersell like uh, a dill pickle. Like, you know, they're, they're special. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, do you have a um, I actually think um, that beverage fermentation is such a really great way to um, take a snapshot of your terroir. Like, um, I love just taking local fruit and making like a quick fruit kvass. I love our bread kvass. Um, I, I love um, flavoring um, water kefirs with you know, what's of the season. So, I mean, every year I'm, I'm going to go home after this conference and I'm going to start collecting uh, lilac flowers and um, flowers from apple trees mm. and cherry trees. And, you know, I love like making meads every year. Um, but I feel like, you know, quick beverage fermentation, whether it's you're doing it for, for wines or whether you're doing it for, um, you know, your beverage uh, or sodas, um, I think it's such a great expression of now, like what's happening right now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's also extraction as well, you know? Like, I mean, you're literally like pulling the essences of ingredients out inside of water. Water is a solvent. It's also a technology too. Absolutely. Um, I want to dig into something you said a little earlier about the um, having each chef learn the HACCP plans because it ties back into this thing that I keep uh, talking about, which is desire and buy-in, right? And I'm curious about how, I guess, um, and whether you felt it necessary to, for example, prepare folks, prepare um, either staff or prepare diners for what they might, the blue cheese flavor that comes out of making, um, you know, milk bread based, fermented milk bread based in, in a bread or anything like that. How do you talk about this stuff? How do you talk about these flavors? Do you need to? I think flavor really speaks for itself, you know, in, in a way more nuanced and complex way than, than I could ever, like, express. Um, you know, we're, you often find like when you when we're when we're asked to speak about flavor, we are at a loss because we're just oh, it's it smells like cherries or it's uh, it tastes like the forest. You know, when act in actuality, the thing you just put in your mouth made all of these receptors go off in your brain and your mind was blown. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as safety is concerned, like you, the. The steps are easy if you understand the process, right? So, you know, like if you're doing pickles, there's one thing you're looking for, which is like the right level of acidity. And that's a really interesting snippet of information that should be passed on to the practitioners, like the people who are in charge of those processes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, flavor for me is just, oh God, it's just like, it's like the symphony always playing in my mind, just all these dots connecting and like, you know, I think it's, it's powerful and also I think it depends on, I personally, I'm not a chef, so I don't deal with customers directly. It's always been like empowerment of staff or just like nerding out with other scientists and, and creatives. Uh, but one thing I think is cool about flavor when you describe it and when you think about it is you've realized how many like different iterations of these flavors there are in many different kinds of ingredients. Uh, from the creative process, when you're recipe building, I think understanding and dialogue with flavor can help you be more create, more prolific in like the effect you could have on people. Uh, for instance, like if you wanna make a fish sauce, but you don't wanna make it with fish, you could use seaweeds to, to pull molecules out of the seaweed making a tea like you would a, like a tea, essentially, and then it tastes fishy, and then you can use the ingredients for soy sauce manufacturing to make something that tastes like a fish sauce, but it's still plant-forward, right? Um, also, like in understanding when like the flavors of blue cheese or like the flavors of specific things come out of fermentation processes, you can understand like what exactly is happening and what produced that. Like blue cheese could be fat breaking down and producing different types of fat molecules that are sometimes considered putrid in some scenarios, but in some other scenarios with pears, it could be amazing, like an elegant dish with some herbs and stuff like that. So like description and kind of dialogue around flavor only makes us become more versatile when we're recipe building and also have a deeper relationship with the components of nature. 
Um, but like pushing stuff like in, like with guests and stuff like that, I feel like um, if I had a choice on my menu and I owned a restaurant, I wouldn't tell people all the little nuances and everything because I would want to let people to create their own journey with their palettes. I mean, yeah, that's exactly sort of my question because you mentioned the putrid thing and like we're all sort of accustomed to blue cheese at this point, yeah. but there are so many flavors that emanate as a result of fermentation yeah. that may or may not be quite so familiar. And I think that's the thing that I'm always sort of curious about is that initial hurdle of no, it's supposed to taste like that or no, it's supposed to look like that. Yeah, well, I don't think anything should taste like anything, but I also think it's important for you to understand why. We should be asking ourselves why more often than not because oh. even though people were making ferments in Mesopotamia, it was a technology then and it is a technology now and us understanding how to kind of like work with this uh, natural process to make it enhanced or better or safer or whatever it all comes from analyzing whether you do it subconsciously whether you invest a lot of time with it or whether it's just little subtle nuances of ana analytics but you know it's important to dig deep into these things um, or just enjoy it as a nice stack because there's gonna be people like me who are digging deep it's really important for all of us to examine the places in our, in, in our experience of everyday life where we come up against revulsion. Like, are we, are we disgusted because it's a culture we don't understand? Are we disgusted because it's a flavor that's just beyond us? And like, how much exposure have we had to this particular thing? Um, have we had enough exposure to understand the nuance? So, you know, like, the, the, the reaction of, of yuck, is, does that really, you know, to stop and ask, like, is this a legitimate response that I'm having right now, or do I just need to try a little bit more? Uh, it's been my lifelong dream to discuss revulsion on stage at the CIA, um, so, so thank you for letting me do that. Uh, no, no it's, it's fascinating, because how much of that is, in fact, conditioning, and mm -hmm. these are ancient processes. I didn't right. like natto when I first tried it, but I crave it now. Yeah. So it, I mean, it really is like you know, how am I? Have I had enough exposure to this thing yet in order to fully understand it? I wonder. Yeah, and I, I suppose like the best way to do that is simply to just menu it and then see what happens, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're saying that you wouldn't t tell people the full story. I know we're running out. I mean, of you know, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. I also wouldn't challenge people too, too, too much because I feel like. Um, it, it's just small doses, you know, you just, you just don't want to throw stuff at people. That, that's how you become inconsiderate. Right. Um, I feel like just like the big people in the big science labs who are making this artificial meat thinking people are going to like it, but they haven't even talked to a person about it. <laughs> like we really got to consider people when, if we want to move forward. And we also got to nurture the environment if we want to move forward. It's important. That is the perfect place to end. Thank you both so much. I could talk to you for hours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks to Rupa, Jason, and Mara. Um, we are going to continue the fermentation talk later in the afternoon with a breakout session um, because we can never talk too much about fermentation. There's not enough time. Um, but also, I wanted to say that uh, Mara and Jason will be at the lunch. Um, and on our call, they had offered that they would love to talk to anybody and everybody about fermentation, so seek them out and ask your questions. Um, they're just such super interesting people to talk about, uh, to talk with. Um, so now I want to uh, introduce executive chef uh, David Standridge of the sustainable seafood focused restaurant, The Shipwright's Daughter, located in Mystic, Connecticut, for a demo on seaweed and sweet and savory applications. Specifically, David will employ sugar kelp, a seaweed native to New England that has multiple uses, highlighted by its culinary and nutritional values and its benefit to planetary health. He'll tell us why we should be eating more kelp, why it's such a culinary powerhouse, and how it can be used across the menu to build flavors in inventive ways. In the last decade, seaweed farming in American waters has gained momentum especially off the coast of New England and Alaska. It's the fastest growing aquaculture sector in the US, offering chefs around the country access in fresh, dried, and frozen forms for the first time. Please help me to welcome Chef David Standridge, who will demonstrate kelp's versatility while talking anatomy, seasonality, sustainability, sourcing, and technique.
Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm David Sanders. I'm the chef of Shipwright's Daughter in Mystic, Connecticut. We're a small coastal community um, in southeastern Connecticut on the coast of the Long Island Sound which incidentally is where sugar kelp is um, native to. It actually comes from Long Island Sound. It only grows on the East Coast, and it only grows north of, that, of there. So anything south of there is the water's too warm for it to grow. Um, it's kind of an amazing crop. Um, so so sorry, like the reason why we're doing any of this is that uh, seaweed and sugar kelp in particular is a tremendous carbon removal um, crop from the oceans and therefore the atmosphere. It basically works as a, as a carbon net. Um, it grows, uh, obviously we know trees are really good at this, but trees take a really long time to grow. Um, sugar kelp grows many times faster than trees. It can grow up to a foot a day. Um, so the plantings of sugar kelp literally just, if you look at sugar kelp under a microscope, it's basically carbon and nitrogen. That's just what it's made out of, and it's got some salt, obviously, and, and water. Um, so growing it is tremendously good for the environment, especially when we're farming it, because we're taking it out of the ocean. So we're trapping all that carbon, taking it out of the ocean, putting it to use, and the carbon doesn't go back into the ocean as if it were to, like if it were to degrade in the ocean. It doesn't go back to the atmosphere. It's kind of gone forever. Um, and then beyond that, it's also quite delicious and really good for you. So it's, it's one of the few crops, I think, that is completely guilt-free. There's no inputs whatsoever. You don't water it. You don't fertilize it, um, unlike land farming. So it's, just, it's kind of a win-win. Um, so I have a couple of recipes that we're going to go through. One is a savory recipe with scallops, and the other one is a, a sweet recipe. So I'm just gonna just run through the ingredients on the first one. It's a seared diver scallop wrapped with sugar kelp, smoked celery root, um, sprouted lentils, uh, cashew puree. We usually do fig leaf oil. This is actually basil oil. Fig leaves are not quite in season. Um, and a green curry sauce. So the, the process is kind of a multi-day recipe if you're doing this at home. Um, the first part of that would be the sprouted lentils, which um, we sprout all the grains that we use in the restaurant. Um, it's, it's a great process to, there's a little bit of nutrition inside of grains that you can't get to unless you sprout them. And it's not accessible to your, to your body through regular digestion. So if we soak those grains overnight and then just basically let them sit out on a tray at room temperature, um, covered lightly, for a day or two, they'll start to get these little sprouties. And um, it not only increases their nutrition, but the texture is greatly improved as well. They kind of get crunchy and fresh. Thank you. So we've got sprouted lentils. We have a cashew puree. Um, which is basically just cashews and water and vinegar. Um, make a nice fine puree, just adds a lot of nuttiness to the dish and some nice creamy texture. And then we have the celery root, which is, is one of um, my personal heroes of um, meat replacement, or if you're trying to do things on the menu that are like, kind of meat-like, um, celery root is a great option for that. I've used it uh, at previous restaurants as a kind of a ham substitute. I don't like to do fake meat but I really do like to be able to create the, ex the, the sort of the experience, the flavor, the texture um, of eating meat, which is a lot of umami flavors. And this is a really great way to do that. I've done this in a Cuban sandwich, which is kind of great. So um, to do that, what we do is we brine the celery root um, exactly like you would brine ham in a, in a, in a, a brine that I actually use for ham. So it's um, vinegar, oh, not vinegar, I'm sorry, salt, sugar, um, spices, herbs. We brine it overnight and then we smoke it. We just use like a little, stove top smoker at the restaurant. You can certainly use a more uh, technologically advanced method. Um, smoke it for about 20 minutes to get a lot of smoke flavor in there. Pretty hot. And then the next step is we wrap it in foil, um, olive oil, uh, various herbs, rosemary, thyme, and then we roast it until it's tender. And then once it's like this, you can do a lot of things with it. You can slice it thin and make sandwiches out of it. Um, and you can do what we're gonna do, which is to pair it with scallops. We also serve it by itself as a, as a vegetarian dish with a similar kind of setup. Um, and then the next thing we have is our scallops, which are just regular diver scallops. But I just wanna talk a little bit about the kelp um, itself. So this is sugar kelp. It gets a lot bigger than this, um, but this is kind of a nice piece of young sugar kelp. It's about an inch and a half wide. As it gets bigger, it gets a lot fatter, and it can also, it um, gets a lot thicker. The texture becomes a little more dense. Um, this you could totally eat raw, like right now, no problem. Um, right out of the water, we eat it all the time. And then when it gets a little bigger, it kind of needs a little bit more process to, get, to make it totally palatable. Um, this part at the top is called the stipe, um, which is my favorite part, actually. We don't use it in this recipe, but it has kind of the texture of a green bean, and we often pickle it. Um, it goes in Bloody Marys, it kind of gets, uh, chopped up and put on various garnishes. It's cool because it doesn't look like seaweed. So you can get people to eat it that don't want to eat seaweed. 
Um, and then this is the frond, which we use for everything else. Okay, so what we're gonna do um, first is, oh, I guess I'll just go through the green curry. It's pretty basic green curry sauce, the ingredients of which are right here. This is uh, tomatillo, coconut oil, garlic, ginger, green curry paste, jalapeno, and um, coconut milk. So really basically what you're doing there is just sweating the, the ginger and garlic and jalapeno down. We add the tomatillo. I love putting tomatillo in this sauce because it, green curry sauces tend to have no acid. And the tomatillo really brings a nice brightness to it. Um, and then um, just strain it out and we have this sauce right here, which I'm gonna warm up. And so then the next process that we're gonna do is to pair the scallops with the celery root. Um, one of the things that you know, we're trying to do, is, there's a lot of factors at play when we create restaurant menus. You know, a lot of it's, um, some of it's creativity and just what tastes good and what looks good, but a lot of it is how to um, make money and stay in business. And the other part that we try to think about a lot is you know, how do we sort of influence the diner to eat how and, and what we want them to eat. And so this is a little bit of an example of trying to reduce the amount of animal protein on the plate, which is better for diets, better for the environment, and also better for the bottom line, because animal protein is actually very, very expensive. Um, in a way that, that's not so noticeable and people won't, uh, will accept it. So we're gonna take the celery root and cut it about the thickness of the scallop, so like so. And then we're gonna cut it out with a ring mold to about the size of a scallop. So we're basically just making like a fake scallop out of the celery root. The bottom part, um, which is quite brown, is actually, that's a good thing. We want that smoky flavor, so we're not worried about that. So now we basically have two scallops, one real, one not real. Um, and then we're gonna score the top, just to give it, when it sears, we're gonna get a little more texture out of it. It's gonna tend to hold the sauce a little better, which is quite nice. And we'll score the scallop. And then we cut them both in half, like this, little half moons. And then we're just gonna put them together and make one little thing. And then we'll take our sugar kelp and we'll just roll that little package. You can bind it with a string, you can bind it with a toothpick, you cannot bind it at all. It actually, this kelp um, was harvested, uh, let's see, Saturday maybe, a couple days before, just the day before I came here, whatever day it is today, I have no idea. Um, and so it's a little tacky because it's been kind of sitting around for, for a day or so, so it'll probably just stick. So you don't really have to, to bind it at all. And then you end up with these nice little packages of scallop and celery root, which we can sear. The frilliness is great, like the overlapping frilliness, because it will get crispy in the pan, and it just adds another texture to the, to the dish. So what we're gonna do is just sear those. It's just a little bit of high temperature oil, canola grapeseed, avocado is great. We'll season these a little bit. Salt and white pepper. And then while those are starting to sear, I'm also just gonna heat up the lentils. Pretty simple for the lentils. We're not doing anything crazy. Um, just a little bit of water. Salt and pepper. You could certainly add um, herbs if you like. But the green curry has a lot of flavor, so we don't really need to do too much to the lentils. So where I live, the, the, the sugar kelp farm is about five miles away. Um, and one of the cool things about it is kind of how it's farmed and how it's produced. Um, the seeds, are, there's actually um, kind of like spores, are produced in a, in a nursery. And then they are put in basically a tank where you've got like a lot of kelp uh, spores that are released into the water. And they take everything out of the tank that the kelp could possibly attach to. And kelp just naturally wants to grab onto things and grow, except for these rolls of kite string. And so the, the spores uh, attach to the kite string and they um, then take the kite string and they roll them out on the farm onto the lines that are strung between buoys. And it kind of grows from the top down, whereas in nature it would grow from the bottom up goes in the top down, and then when they go out to harvest it, they just kind of pull up the lines, slice off the kelp on the bottom, and it regenerates, um, as long as you don't take the stipe. Okay, so we should be nicely seared. 
Thank you. <laughs> Wardrobe malfunction. And there's got a little butter, herbs, garlic, and basties a little bit. So we want to serve um, scallops medium rare, but you do want to get the celery root to be uh, somewhat hot. And then that's basically the dish. So we're going to take the cashew puree and just do kind of a little smear on the plate. Sprouted lentils. our scallops on top and so that you kind of get some various textures of kelp in this dish which I kind of like you know some of it is somewhat raw um, it's most of it's cooked and then the top part is very crispy and then we'll take this guy and do a quick foam It's a fairly elegant dish that you can serve in a fine dining environment or at a dinner party or whatever. Um, and it just kind of shows what kelp can do. I'm going to go through a lot of spoons. My dishwashers hate me. And basil oil, or as I said, we usually use fig leaf oil, which is quite a different flavor. And there you have it. That's number one. So next, we're going to do something that's maybe a little bit of a more unusual uh, use of kelp that people wouldn't think of, which is uh, kelp for dessert. Um, I think it pairs really nicely. The first way I thought about this is when we were, you know, my job is, you know, I'm really good friends with, this, with the kelp farmer for one thing, but also I just really wanted people to start eating this. So our role at the restaurant is to try to figure out ways to get people to eat it. The same thing with sustainable seafood. You've got a lot of underutilized species that people don't want to eat. They really want a nice cod fillet. So we just try to trick them into eating it in any way we can um, and get them to open their minds to a new thing. And dessert is a great way to do that. You know, when you come to a restaurant, you might not want to experiment with your $40 entree, but uh, by the time you're done with having a really nice meal, you might go for a weird dessert because, I'm just give it a try, it's 10 bucks. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do here, I'll just kind of run through this dish, it's a espresso flan. Um, with uh, a kelp coconut dolce de leche. Uh, we also make this dish with like straight caramel that's based with sugar. I kind of want to do one that was a little less refined sugar heavy. Um, a candied sugar kelp, kind of crunchy, and a dark chocolate sauce. And uh, yeah, that's it. So the ingredients for the flan are pretty straightforward. Um, I've made this one with coconut milk. You can certainly do a traditional flan with uh, milk or cream. Uh, brown sugar, um, espresso, egg yolks. So what we basically do here is just heat up the, the base, whichever base you're using, infuse it with the espresso and the melted brown sugar into it, strain the espresso out, um, cool it down, add your egg yolks, combine the whole thing, and then you're gonna get basically this. Although this still has the, the grinds in it, I would suggest straining those out. Um, and then, let's, over here, I'm just gonna start the coconut dolce de leche, which is made exactly how you would make any other kind of dolce de leche, which is basically by cooking milk. In this case, we're gonna cook the coconut milk down until it, it caramelizes. So um, we're gonna add brown sugar to that. It's a pretty decent amount of brown sugar. It's not for the diabetics in the audience, I would say. Um, and we'll just bring it to a boil, and we'll cook this down until it is the consistency of uh, dolce de leche, which is kind of like a sweet paste. And then um, for this one, we're going to use dried sugar kelp. There's a couple of different ways that we um, preserve kelp. Um, you know, it's, it's a fresh product. The shelf life on sugar kelp, when we get into the restaurant, which we usually get it directly from the farm, harvested either that day or the day before, is like five to seven days um, fresh in the refrigerator. But it is really important for a lot of reasons to figure out ways to preserve it. Um, one is we want to buy as much as possible during the very short season to support our farmer. 
Um, we like to use it, so we want to use it throughout the year and not just for the, the couple of weeks that it's available. So um, one of the major ways to do that, obviously, is to dry it. Um, the farmer, Susie, does a lot of drying industrially, kind of at, at scale where she is. We dry it ourselves. It can stay in flake form, dried for kind of forever. Um, and then, of course, we'll grind it into powders. Using seasoning mixes, rice seasonings, you make furikake out of it, many, many things. And then um, we also pickle a great deal of it. There's a company in my town uh, called Maromi Shoyu who does artisanal shoyu, and they do a, a sugar kelp version as well, so it's definitely usable in fermentation applications as well. So this is going to come to a boil and then reduce, and then we're just going to add the powdered sugar kelp to it because we really don't want um, chewy kelp leaves in our dolce de leche, and just stir that in. Mm -hmm. And then as you cook that down, it will eventually look something like this. Um, obviously, when it's hot, it's going to be a little looser. But then we'll take this product, and we will put a little layer in the bottom of a ramkin. I would recommend like, spraying these with a non-cook spray or non-stick spray. And this one is a little uh, cold, so you have to kind of spread it. In its normal form, when it's, when it's hot, it will be more liquidy. So I'm going to put like, a little less than a quarter of an inch on the bottom. And then we're going to take um, this, if it's hot and cool it down, so it's at least a little solid so it doesn't come together with the, with the flan base. And then we'll add the flan base. I'm just going to pour it. Leave about a quarter of an inch at the top. This goes into the oven at about 300 degrees um, in a water bath for an undisclosed amount of time. I think it's about half an hour on the actual recipe. I've always found flan to be like very tricky in that one day it'll take 15 minutes because the oven's hot and the water's hot, and the other day it'll take an hour and a half because something went awry. So basically, you just take it out when it stops jiggling is the best thing I can recommend with that. And then the other major element of this dish is the candied sugar kelp, which is another way that we um, preserve the, the kelp. So I just wanted to kind of run through that process. It's a really great product. Um, you can sell it as candy. You can make it into many, many, many things. Um, and it's also kind of beautiful. It's kind of a little bit of a showstopper, and that comes, becomes this kind of glass kelp product. And it's a little salty, sweet, briny. Uh, if you like salted caramel, you would probably like candied sugar kelp. So what we're doing there is basically bringing a syrup up to temperature. Um, there's kind of two ways to do this. In the recipe, I've kind of noted that it's up to 270 degrees, which is the hard ball stage, but still tacky. Um, so we're reducing water and sugar until enough water has come out of it for the, temp the boiling point to be at 270 degrees. Now, um, once it's at that point, this is a little not at that point, but that's okay, I just want to show you. Um, we take the kelp and we very carefully drop it into the very hot sugar and then kind of let it cook for just a minute. You can kind of see when the texture changes and it starts to soften a little bit and um, some of the water has come out of the kelp. And then you just take it out, put it on a silk pad, or if you want to use parchment paper and spray it, that's fine too, but something that's very nonstick. And then since we're cooking it at 270 degrees and not 325 degrees, um, which I find to be a little easier, it then goes into the oven at 325 degrees to fully caramelize the sugars. Um, I've also inadvertently left it in the oven until it caramelizes, and it's quite delicious as a, as a kind of a, almost a charred product. So that's how you do that. And then what you get at the end is, like I said, this beautiful candied sugar cup. And then for this recipe, we take that and we kind of mash it up, um, just generally smash it with these toasted sesame seeds to make a topping, a crunchy topping for the flan. Okay. Last but not least, we have my world famous, very complicated chocolate sauce, which is dark chocolate. I've been doing that. I've been an executive chef for 12 years. I've never made a different chocolate sauce in this. I like to take the easy route, try the easiest way first, and then go from there. So just hot water and chocolate, and then stir it until it melts. <laughs> Advanced techniques, my specialty. We'll leave this here, and that'll, that'll melt. And then, the next step is, is to finish it. 
So the flans, after they come out of the oven, they go in the refrigerator. Um, it's not a hot dish, it's a, it's a cold to room temperature dish. Um, it's gonna help the flan to fully set up. And then you simply invert it onto a plate. Um, perfect. Stab it a few times with a, a knife. It's unlikely that it will pop out at that point. So um, usually take, hit it with a torch. Um, and you're gonna be a little careful. You don't wanna burn the, um, the dolce de leche in there. Burnt kelp is not the, the best flavor in this way. And if you do this kind of lightly, it'll kind of pop. You can see it fall. And there we go. And so you've got kind of the layer of the espresso flan that you can see the caramel, uh, caramelized dolce de leche on top. And our chocolate sauce is almost ready. And then we have the candy sugar kelp and sesame. And then, yeah, a couple flowers, why not? Everybody likes flowers. It's California, flowers everywhere. There you go, and that's that. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we have time for a couple of questions. Sure. If you're not living in a coastal area, you know, how, and you want to start working with seaweed, mm -hmm. how do you do that? Um, um, you know, and is there anything that you need to know when you're uh, scaling up? Yeah, I mean, a um, couple of, of ways. So you can order this seaweed in its dry form from Stone Gin Kelp Company um, or anywhere the, the New England Kelp Cooperative. You can get um, seaweed on the west coast, certainly from Monterey Bay Seaweeds is going on here. There's not any farmed sugar kelp out here, but they do a lot of tank-grown kelps, and they do a lot of tank-grown seaweeds for culinary use, and they also harvest um, wild harvest seaweed on the west coast. If you're in the middle of the country, um, slightly less options, obviously, mail order. Um, the other thing, I think, that when we're looking at this food system as a whole, and we're trying to get seaweed into people's diets, it can matter a little less where it comes from, because what we're trying to do is get people to eat a certain way. And it would be great if everybody could get fresh um, sugar kelp across the nation, and maybe one day we'll be able to get those distribution channels um, in place. Certainly a lot of people are working very hard on that. But I think it's incorporating seaweed into the diet in different ways that can get people interested. Um, and that's, that's kind of the most important thing from a chef perspective. Um, and we also have a question, uh, does uh, kelp absorb pollutants in the water and, and then have to be treated? Um, that's a great question. In Connecticut, we have a really great, um, all this kind of started in Connecticut. So this is kind of a great regulatory system there. So for this kelp to be sold, um, once it's on the farm, they cannot sell it for public consumption until it's tested for heavy metals. Um, even though it's grown in the same place every year and the water quality is A+, plus, um, the, the department comes in, they, they take a sample, they test it to make sure that it's safe for consumption. So it's an extremely safe product, and that's one of the differences between um, the seafood, this particular product, and seaweeds that you're getting from Asia, perhaps. Um, some of those are produced with less regulatory control, or wild harvest seaweed, where you're not really sure where it's coming from, what's the water quality, um, because the answer is yes, it can absorb a lot of things from the water. And in fact, um, there's a pilot program in the Gowanus Canal in New York, which if you're not from New York, is like the most polluted body of water in the world, perhaps, um, where they've started a sugar kelp colony in an effort to remove some of those toxins and heavy metals from the water. Obviously, we're not eating that. Um, it's going somewhere else, but um, it's very useful for that as well. Okay, and then uh, we have a question about language is very important when promoting new foods. Sugar kelp is a great name. What do you think about the term sea vegetables? I think whatever works. Honestly, um, you know, we have to be creative with our menu, uh, our menu words. Um, as long as it's not disingenuous, it's, it's not actually a vegetable, it's an algae, but I think no one wants to eat algae, generally speaking. So uh, I do refer to it as a sea vegetable. Sugar kelp is a great, uh, great name. It, it's called that because it's sweeter than most kelps. It's not sweet by any means. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think just go for it. And then the last thing that I'll uh, ask you about is, it seems like you've, you've sort of gone all in across your menu. <laughs> and so uh, how I originally came upon you was in uh, an article in Plate Magazine that was talking about a kelp and wine 
dinner that you were mm -hmm. doing. And so can you talk more about that, um, you know, uh, the R&D that goes into that thinking about wines with kelp? Yeah, um, you know, my short kelp origin story for me is that I was a chef in New York City for 20 years and I moved to Mystic just before the pandemic. And when I, before I got there, I started Instagramming who, who's, what's going on in food. The whole idea was I'm going where the stuff comes from finally. After me in New York, where everything's shipped in. And so I was just trying to figure out what was going on. I stumbled upon Susie Flores and the Stonington Cup Company, who now are really good friends with us. Um, and then that's when they started the Kelp Harvest Festival. And I learned about it and it, we just kind of went all in, maybe because we're friends, but also because you know, as a restaurant, we wanted to try to do something good. Um, and so that is our focus, and, and I put it all over the menu. It's just always been my technique for how to get people to eat things is different forms. It's everywhere. It, sometimes it's in the middle of the plate. Sometimes it's in an aioli, and you don't even know it's there. So even if you don't choose it, you probably ate it, and then I can tell you that you ate it, and maybe you'll choose it next time. Um, and so that's kind of my game. Um, what was the rest of that question? I don't remember. Oh, yeah. And so um, I'm very lucky to be married to a wine person. Um, who my wife Kathleen Standard is our sommelier and kind of brand manager. And we do these wine dinners and we thought, we'll just do a kelp one um, that's all kelp. And so, you know, we have these wine meetings with the, uh, 20 or 30 wines that we taste and we try to pick what's going on and I, I'll create menu items to, to pair with them. Um, and she did a whole thing on, on different wines. And it really is just another way to look at this as a food product. And for us as a high-end food product that you can eat in a high-end restaurant. Um, because I think that kind of cachet, if you can label a product that way is it trickles down and people start to want it, other chefs start to want to use it, um, and you can have an influence and start to, to make a little bit of change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So the good news is that we will be able to try the flan at lunch today. Um, so thank you, David, for that uh, demonstration. And now, in collaboration and sponsorship with Puma One Foods USA, we are pleased to announce the Culinary Institute of America's digital media initiative, the Asian Plant Forward Kitchen Korea. This is the first edition of the Culinary Institute of America's Asian Plant Forward Kitchen series, which seeks to document the best of plant forward culinary traditions in Asia. And now we'll watch a short video introducing the new series. modern metropolis of Seoul to a tranquil 7th century Buddhist temple in the South Korean mountains. Korean cuisine is at the leading edge of today's plant forward movement. Today's Korean chefs are redefining global dining trends, presenting their guests with bold flavors and exciting creations. In many ways, Korean cuisine is uniquely suited to the plant forward movement. Korean culinary history encompasses an immense collection of vegetable dishes. In this part of Asia, Buddhist monks and nuns introduced elaborate vegan temple cuisine over 1,600 years ago. Every country has a few signature dishes that illuminate its culture. In this documentary, we'll see how Korean chefs build flavor using fermentation and other culinary techniques. The Asian Plant Forward Kitchen Korea is the first edition of the Culinary Institute of America's and Pol Muan's Asian Plant Forward Kitchen series. A first-of-its-kind curriculum initiative documenting the best of plant-forward culinary traditions in Asia. The culinary expertise and creativity of these chefs show us that plant-forward food can be craveable to even the most dedicated carnivores. Join us on this appetizing tour of South Korea as we reveal innovative and inspiring plant-forward flavors of this beloved Asian region that is attracting diners from around the world. You can watch the full documentary at plantforwardkitchen.org slash korea. And now we head to our walk around lunch and sponsor exchange 
with tastings from Oatly, Homo and Foods USA, Barilla America, Veg by McCain Food Service Solutions, the Mushroom Council, and demo dishes by presenting chefs, including Keisha Griggs, uh, infamous Curie Jackfruit, Isabel Fridge's roasted and raw cabbage salad, and David Standridge's espresso flan with sugar kelp coconut dulce de leche and candied sesame kelp crunchies. Uh, Ista will be signing copies of her book, Mezcla, and we'll meet back here in Ecolab at 1.15, where we'll start off our exciting afternoon activities. Thank you. I'm Mingles Restaurant owner chef Kang Mingo. Mingles is used in Korean restaurants to create a new dishes of Korean contemporary restaurant. Today, our chef's favorite is the popular Korean bibimbap. I made a dessert of the bibimbap. I made a dessert of ice cream and chopped rice pudding. On top of it, 제철에 구할 수 있는 다양한 나물과 허브들을 곁들였습니다. 그리고 비빔밥의 가장 중요한 양념인 저온에 로스팅한 참기름 그리고 한국 음식에서 가장 중요한 간장을 곁들여서 저희 스타일의 새로운 비빔밥 디저트를 만들어냈습니다. 허브는 지금철에 가장 어, 맛이 좋은 다양한 한국의 허브들인데요. 취나물, 나문제라고 하는 허브 그리고 솔, 어린 솔나무 소나무의 순인 송순 그리고 다양한 식용꽃, 오이꽃 이런 유기농 허브들도 곁들여져 있습니다. 한국은 70%가 산으로 구성되어 있고 30% 정도가 그 땅으로 구성되어 있어요. 그래서 다양한 산들에서 다양한 종류의 와일드 허브들이 많이 자라는데 그런 그 허브들을 저희는 나물이라 부르고 그런 나물을 데치기도 하고 생으로 먹기도 하고 말리기도 하고 다양한 방법으로 먹어요. 오늘은 저희 디저트에는 유제품도 활용을 했는데요. 만약 비건이나 베지테리안이 이 음식을 드시고 싶으시면 소이밀크나 견과류, 아몬드 밀크 같은 견과류 우유를 사용하셔서 비건 버전으로도 만들 수 있습니다. 저희는 오픈 때부터 생산자들과 다양하게 소통을 하고 생산자에게 많은 재료를 직 매입을 했거든요. 그리고 지금 근교 서울 근교 저희 레스토랑에서 차로 30분 정도 걸리는 곳에 농부님과 소통을 하면서 다양한 작물을 기획하고 재배를 하고 있어요. 그리고 또 다른 서, 서울이 서울에서 한 3, 4시간, 5시간 정도 걸리는 지방에서 생산되는 다양한 농작물들이 과잉 생산되는 경우는 저희가 전량 매입을 해서 저희가 새로운 메뉴에 쓰기도 하고 생산자들과 늘 지속 가능한 관계를 맺고 그들이 지속 가능하게 농업에 집중할 수 있도록 많은 도움을 드리려 노력하고 있습니다. 한국 재료만 사용해야 된다는 그런 고정관념을 가질 필요가 없는 것 같아요. 제가 해외에 많이 출장을 다니게 되면 그 현지에서 가장 좋은 로컬 그리고 시즈널 잉그리디언트를 찾고요. 거기에서 한국 음식을 할때 가장 중요한 것은 한국 음식의 맛을 낼수 있는 장들, 그리고 한국의 식초들, 그리고 한국의 그 참기름이나 가진 양념들이라고 저희 부르는데 뭐 고춧가루가 됐던 뭐 이런 산초 후추가 됐던 장아찌류들 그런 절임류 그런 어찌 보면은 스몰 팬트리 그로서리만 가지고 있으면은 가장 좋은 시즌을 재료를 가지고 전 세계 어디서든 음식을 만들 수 있어요. 그래서 좋은 식재료를 가지는 게 일단 제일 중요하고 한국 음식을 만들기 위해서. 그리고 제가 방금 말씀드렸던 한국 음식에 꼭 필요한 에센셜 이런 소스들, 장류나 절임류, 발효류 그런 식재료들을 가지고 있, 있으면 될것 같습니다. 그게 가장 어, 팁이라기보다는 가장 중요한 기본적인 이런 시작인 것 같아요. 항상 저희 
그러니까 제일 익사이팅한 부분은 좋은 재료들 그리고 뭔가 새로운 재료를 만났을 때 가장 좋고 그걸 어떻게 저희 음식에 적용하고 새로운 음식을 만들 수 있을까에 대한 부분인 것 같아요. 그리고 계속 민글스를 운영하다 보니 한국 음식에서 가장 중요한 식재료인 장, 간장, 된장, 고추장을 어떻게 활용할 수 있을까에 대한 고민을 되게 많이 하고 그런 고민들이 되게 항상 설레게 만듭니다. 저희 한식도 이런 저희의 전통적인 한식 그리고 어센틱한 한식에 대한 관심을 갖고 그걸 베이스로 다양한 그 전세계의 뭐 기술들을 더해서 새로운 형태의 한식이지만 누가 느껴도 한국적인 느낌을 가질 수 있는 그런 한국 음식의 뭐 영역의 확장 새로운 한식의 형태도 또 다른 이제 한식의 영역으로 이렇게 평가받을 수 있는 게 미래에 일어날 것 같습니다. 저는 서울 마포구 동화동에서 베이스 이즈 나이스라는 채소 친화적 식공간을 운영하고 있는 장진아라고 합니다. 저는 지난 한 10년 정도 뉴욕에서 레스토랑을 기획하고 또 메뉴와 그리고 디자인 마케팅을 디렉팅하는 일을 해왔어요. 그래서 사실 직접 요리를 한 거는 이 베이스 이즈 나이스라는 식공간을 열면서 처음 하게 됐습니다. 항상 육류나 해산물 요리에 가니쉬나 아니면은 그냥 반찬에 이렇게 사이드 드시로만 좀 대접을 너무 못 받고 있었던 거예요. 그래서 저는 그 한국의 채소의 맛에서 그 경험한 그런 재발견을 어, 토대로 어, 채소가 주인공인 그런 식탁을 한번 꿈꾸며 이 공간을 만들게 됐어요. 오늘 준비해드린 어, 메인 디쉬에는 그 연근과 그리고 꽈리고추 구이를 올렸어요. 연근은 그 뿌리 채소지만 음, 쓴맛이 강하거나 그렇지 않아요. 대신에 아삭한 맛과 그리고 담백한 맛 때문에 어떤 양념이든 잘 흡수하는 장점을 갖고 있거든요. 그리고 지금 제철에, 제철을 맞아서 더 맛이 좋아진 꽈리고추 이렇게 두 가지 채소를 된장과 참깨로 그 맛을 낸 양념을 더해서 네, 구운 채소 BBQ 두 가지 준비했습니다. 오늘 두 가지의 채소밥을 준비를 했는데요. 우선 공통으로 들어가는 밥은 추청이라는 품종의 쌀에 유기농 찹쌀, 약용 귤피, 발효 귀리, 흑보리 이렇게 혼합을 해서 밥을 지었어요. 어, 우선 첫 번째 그김 느타리 버섯 퓨레 그 채소밥은 김과 느타리 버섯으로 그 졸여서 만든 채소 퓨레를 네, 그 가운데 얹고요. 그리고 위에는 산초 향을 얹은 만가닥 버섯 구이를 올렸습니다. 그리고 마지막으로는 어, 그 단호박 칩을 올려서 바삭한 식감을 더했고요. 그리고 이제 끝으로는 네, 그 참나물을 조금 올려서 향을 더했습니다. 그리고 다른 한 가지는 가지고추 밥인데요. 가지고추는 여름 채소인 가지와 풋고추 두 가지를 교종을 해서 키운 가지고추라는 채소예요. 매운맛은 거의 없어요. 하지만 어, 가지가 갖고 있는 영양소와 그리고 풋고추가 갖고 있는 그 청량한 향을 그대로 품고 있는 채소입니다. 가지고추를 어, 아주 가볍게 익혀서 들깨로 맛을 낸 들깨 겨자장을 네, 그 간을 더했고요. 어, 고추가 갖고 있는 매운맛과 조금은 다른 
영양 부추가 갖고 있는 매운 맛을 조금 더 더해서 두 개의 매운 맛이 이렇게 앙상블이 나도록 토핑을 했어요. 어, 참나물은 제가 이제 미국 생활을 마치고 한국으로 돌아와서 가장 저에게 충격을 줬던 그런 채소 중에 하나예요. 우선은 한국에서는 사계절 내내 이 참나물을 맛볼 수가 있고요. 참나물만의 갖고 있는 향미가 굉장히 은근히 아주 오래가고 깊은 향을 품고 있어서 네, 어, 보통 한국에서는 나물을 많이 해서 먹지만 저는 이 참나물이 갖고 있는 식감과 향미를 살려서 오늘 국에 네, 사용을 했습니다. 한국에서 영양부추는 어, 굉장히 헤어처럼 부드럽고 네, 그리고 이게 마늘에서 온 매운맛이 있는데 그 매운맛은 마치 감칠맛을 연상시킬 정도의 기분 좋은 알싸한 매운맛을 품고 있어요. 적양배추는 요즘 이렇게 날이 따뜻해지면서 굉장히 그 살결이 부드러워졌어요. 음, 특히 적양배추는 그 보라색, 영롱한 보라색 색깔을 갖고 있어서 이 색을 그대로 살릴 수 있는 요리를 하는 게 중요하다고 생각을 해요. 왜냐하면 채소의 색은 맛의 일부거든요. 인류와 음식의 관계는 언제나 긍정적이고 아름다워야 한다고 음. 생각을 해요. 어, 제가 채소에 대해서 관심을 굉장히 많이 갖게 된 이유는 바로 채소의 본질을 발견했기 때문인데요. 채소는 매 계절, 자신의 계절에 우리 곁에 가까이 오는 너그러움이 있고 또 어, 아주 값비싸지 않다는 네, 그런 소탈함이 있고요. 그렇게 긍정적인 음식과 인류의 그런 관계를 만들어주는데 채소는 굉장히 큰 역할을 한다고 생각을 합니다. bring the sauce to a boil. Simmer and reduce until most of the liquid is gone. Set the noodles aside in a serving bowl and we'll start adding all of our delicious toppings. Here, I've made some curried quinoa using Noor Professional Liquid Concentrated Vegetable Base, some Hellman's Lemon Zatar Vinaigrette and curry powder. Place the quinoa to one side of the bowl. Next, toss some arugula with Hellman's Lemon Zatar Vinaigrette. Place some of the dressed arugula on the noodles. Now top with assorted roasted seasonal vegetables. Here, I have some beets, roasted fennel, some delicata squash, and roasted carrots, and some pickled peppers. And garnish with slices of beautiful golden beets, and drizzle generously with Hellman's spicy mayo. Your customers will love this hearty, produce-packed bowl. Enjoy! I'm Hina Patel. You are at my restaurant Pesharam in Dock Page in San Francisco. Let me show you how to make it simple. So we're gonna temper our oil with some whole uh, mustard seeds, cumin. I love my curry leaves. There is no substitution. The flavor, the fragrance it gives is very eye-catching and addictive. This is the combination of the ragdo and the patties. These are my boiled mashed potatoes. In this, you can add uh, leftover bread, breadcrumbs. Today, I'm going to use a little bit of breadcrumbs here, dry panko. 
just for the crunch but also keep the potato together so it's not falling apart you can use mushroom or green onion i love that version of it as well this are our fresh cilantro chopped i love the turmeric is a big part of our cuisine and i'm gonna crush this are our whole cumin i'm gonna crush it it releases the oil and little crunch of the cumin it gonna get toasted when we cook our patties this are i love the heat of the serrano chili is not overwhelming but it gives a little punch you can always replace it with a jalapeno if you want less or fresno red chili thai red chilies it's very pungent very spicy if you really looking for more flavor so this is my whole black mustard seeds we going to pop it very important you need to pop that this is our cumin it takes less time so we do it after this is one of my favorite and now you can find it gluten free version is asafoetida hing i don't cook without it this gonna splatter i suggest be aware of that see the smell that comes from this is our onion It's very quick. We're tempering our oil with whole. I use the same water. I soak my legumes. Of course, I pre-wash it and use that same water. Whole thing goes in. little more water now we cooking down our peas needs little water to make them soft again i'm going to add now little spices i'm very proud of this blend and it's a must this uh, combination of dry fenugreek leaves and we have coriander and fennel but that that brings the dish alive i do use seeds as well but this one has a dry fenugreek leaves methi uh in gujarati we call it we use a fresh and the dry version but the fresh is very labor intensive is very hard to find every season but dry you can keep dry all year around and crushing that mixing with other coriander fennel the fragrance it gives uh, it's something if you reheat the sauce but that uh, it goes all around the house whenever my mom uses it and as soon as she puts the something hot is we you know it's a dinner time because you can smell it even far away in the house you don't need much there is a misconception of using the ground turmeric you don't need too much like for this much amount of sauce quarter of the teaspoon of the turmeric is enough if you use a lot the sauce can get bitter so the gujarati cuisine is combination of of course using dry spices with the fresh this is my fresh ginger juice pure ginger with the skin and everything we're going to add some chilies crushed garlic and the chili as much as you like i'm going to go with two going to add all my onions this is it we're going to leave it you can cover it on a low flame till our legumes are soft I love the of course saltiness of the sea salt. I like to use that non iodized sea salt. 
you know the our cuisine also the big part using black salt so the black salt we do use it when the sauce is about to be done and that black salt comes in my chaat masala so chaat masala is a combination of ginger powder black salt cumin again but that adding that dish or adding this masala in the end you feel like you having a indian sauce the other best version if you have the stir fried mashed mushroom or stir fried peas you can crush it you make a little bowl and you can fill it up any filling you like and you make the bowl again and then you have a double texture with your aloo tikki and it's not as you eating potatoes all i'm the second uh, daughter we are five sisters so the whole family sit on a kitchen floor and we make this together you know one thing i want to talk about is indian cuisine of course is layering of the flavors but also when to add your spices it's very important because you do not want to burn the spices the ground spices especially so i want to kind of talk about a little bit about when to add our spices if you using the whole spices i say whole cloves pepper balls cinnamon stick all that should go in the beginning but if you have already toasted already grounded or turmeric is like a powder that gonna burn in that intense heat so when you what i do what when i was learning myself in a oil you toast like we did with the mustard seed cumin whole cinnamon stick but then if you want to add your turmeric or red chili powder or my fenugreek coriander paste add little water so you not gonna burn the ground spices that's the little trick and you let it toast your ground spices till the water evaporates then of course the second layer is adding the tomatoes or adding the vegetables and now your base is already spiced This dish is simple, but I'm telling you, if you make this, this is perfect afternoon snack. It's filling. So this is my mint and cilantro chutney. Very few ingredients: cilantro, two to one to mint, lemon juice, uh, some toasted curry leaves, and cumin, and fresh lemon juice. That's it. This I crush together, and that parts up the whole dish. This is my date and tamarind, fresh tamarind and dates. I cook it together with touch of uh, lime juice and uh, Kashmiri chili. So it gives the tartness, the heat. This is you can find very easy. It says our uh, chickpea noodles. This is the fine version of it. You can make it, of course, at home. You can also find at the ready-made version of it. Different size, different crunch. But the finer it is, 
the smooth it gets when you bite. I'm gonna top it with some fresh cilantro. Gonna have a little bit of chaat masala. I love onion. I love the freshness of raw onion. You can skip it if it's do not like the taste of it. This is it. This is my ragda patties.